Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two friends who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm Courtney. And I'm MK. And how are you? Um, you know, I'm okay. <clears throat> I have just been trying to enjoy the last dregs of summer. I mean, I saw like two weeks before I start work, but like it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> it feels like no. everything is over. <laughs> You can't have two weeks because that means I'm with you and I, that's too short of a period of time yeah. between now and then. Correct. I um, love you, but that is a short period of time between now and then. Yeah. 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 Um, my, uh, my rent the runway dress for the wedding is oh, already yeah. came in. And so then I was like, shit, that means that the wedding's <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, but in my, um, trying to enjoy summer, um, uh, my aunt, who is also one of my best friends who I worked with. Um, she has a really good friend from school who teaches in Germany and comes home every summer for a week or two. And we had our um, our annual summer fiesta hangout. Um, and we decided to do it by going to pub trivia, Love. which I have never done, actually done before. And apparently there are people who like make it their only job to do pub trivia i'm telling yeah. you like because i'm smart and we were in like fifth place no you have too much random knowledge which is also how i feel when i do trivia with other people i'm like i have too much random knowledge i don't know how you got here um and you're yeah. doing better than me well but speaking of my random unfortunate amount of knowledge i just found out yesterday that there is a new version of jeopardy coming out um called pop culture jeopardy Stop. that colin jost is going to be the host of i love colin jost i he's one of the top five things about the olympics right now for me just kidding he's probably in the top 10 but not the top five but i will get because i didn't even know he was there I'm so um, disconnected from the Olympics. You are my um, tune direct in, sounding board. Tune in to next uh, next Thursday's. It'll be so far past the Olympics when next Thursday's episode comes out. But everything I want to say about the Olympics, I will say on next Thursday's episode. Just so I thought you were telling me, and I was like, I don't even know where I'm going to be next Thursday. No, no, no. Um, I'm telling our <laughs> listeners that because we are bonus recording. On Yay. today, August 5th, we will be recording an episode that will not come out until September. Who's to say? I Who's think it's like say? the first week of September. I'll be um, a new person by then. And in that uh, episode, I will tell you all of my feelings about the Olympics. It will be incredibly irrelevant. <laughs> but, but what's new? What's, what's new about new? our show? Um. <laughs> But yeah, so I now want to be on pop culture trivia with um, Colin Jost, except for that after my pub trivia night last night I, or last week, I feel like I am no longer eligible to pretend that I'm smart enough to do these kind of shows mm -hmm. um, because it was ridiculous. Although I will say there was one moment. It was one of the, so the way that the trivia worked was that like for every round, there was multiple choice questions. And then at the end of the round, there was like a, double dare question and you had to like write an answer and if you got it right you doubled your points if you got it wrong you lost all your points for that round if you just didn't answer it you were fine like was, you didn't okay it was like a dare and one of the questions for the double dare question was um in what film does arnold schwarzenegger's care like go on a virtual reality trip to mars only to turn out that he's actually on the red planet and I yanked the paper away from Chris and wrote my answer so fast. And I just handed it to him. And he goes, you didn't even have a conversation. I go, oh, I didn't, I didn't need a conversation. What movie is it? Total Recall. Oh, I still haven't seen that. And I was like, we don't need a conversation. We're good. And then one of the questions was, one of the double questions was, who is the youngest NFL coach to ever win a Super Bowl? And Carrie and I were like, okay. And I was like, no, but like, how young was Belichick when he won his first one? And we were like going back and forth. And I was like, he can't have been. And when she goes, oh my God, it's Sean McVay. And I go, oh my God, you're right. So then we wrote it. And Chris was like, I can't, I don't want to take you to anywhere. Um, well, <laughs> Except we, pub trivia. Yeah, for sure. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> one question, we went with my gut answer and I was wrong. And we oh, should have listened to Chris. 
But then the next question, we went with his gut answer, even though I told him it wasn't that one and that he was wrong and it was the one I wanted. And so I was like, okay, we're even now. Now stop. Now we don't get to now. Now we have to have conversations because. Um, yeah, the, the gut answer that um they got wrong that I knew was that Jimmy Carter co-authored a book with his daughter that had the absolutely most unhinged name I've ever heard. Um, hold on. I had to... Uh, what is it? It is unhinged. Jimmy Carter... Well, Meredith Gray, what? That's <laughs> Google. Quite Google. Right. Oh, the little baby snoogle germ. That's not, those aren't words. Those yeah. are zero percent words. Correct. Um, he cool. and his daughter, it started as a like bedtime story that he made up to tell his daughter. And then he and his daughter wrote this book. And before the multiple choice questions came up, it was like, which former president wrote this book? And I was like, Jimmy Carter. And then the choices came up and Jimmy Carter was one of them. And they were like, are you sure? And I was like, of course I'm not sure. I just fucking said Jimmy Carter. Like, I don't know. And they, so then we ended up going with Bill Clinton. And I was like, I don't know. Like, mm-hmm. yes, obviously, like Bill has written books. With James Chester. Patterson. Yes, which we went on a deep dive about that book too. But I go, but, and Chelsea has co-written books with Hillary. So it's like, so it's not, it's not out of the realm of possibility. So because I'm not confident, I will let you have it. Of course it was Jimmy Carter. Fucking listen to me. Yeah. I mean, anytime there's like a president question, (laughs) I'm for sure going with you. Like, I mean, granted, I don't know the answer 90% of the time when it comes to president (laughs) stuff. But if I had yeah. to pick a friend to call about president stuff, it'd be you. Thank you. I appreciate so, that. Anytime. Um, but yeah, so that's your random dose of things I learned at Pub Trivia. Uh, I that. Jimmy Carter wrote a book called The Little Baby Snoogle Fleeter. <laughs> I love it. How are you? I'm Ken. Hi. It is 10.30 a.m., I think. Um, I. Yeah. yeah, that feels right. Um, and I've just had a morning. I woke up at 7 a.m. in a panic because I didn't set my alarm. And I said, oh, no, it's got to be 11 a.m. And I have missed recording time. No, don't fret. It was 7 a.m. Like I've woken up every other morning this week. But today, today I was certain that it was not. Um, <laughs> so I woke up immediately in a panic. And then I laid there for hours, it felt like. And then I, you know, I showered and I was like, okay, I'm getting back into like people mode. I'm getting some coffee, taking a shower, letting the dog out. Everything's going fine. We're getting ready to record our four hour marathon. I sit down, I open my laptop. It's purple. The screen is purple. And you know this because I've been yelling at you about it for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe more. Um, And I have now bought a new laptop that I had to decide within an hour, or I could not get it tomorrow because not tomorrow, but the next day I'm on a plane at 8 a.m. So it had to be tomorrow. Um, I spent money I don't have to get a laptop that I thought I didn't need. Um, So I'll recover, but probably not today. Not today. So I'm I'm gonna make it. I'm okay. I can still at least like see my laptop. Um don't worry, also, I'll show you yeah. on TikTok. Yeah, if- I was gonna say also for those of you watching this on YouTube, we are not using her laptop to record this. <laughs> no, I've um I've switched to gears. Thank God Rachel has a backup backup laptop, like everything in her life, which has become very convenient for me. Um yes. so I, I do have a laptop to use today for this purpose and for working purposes um because also my laptop for those of you who for some reason don't know that's the only way i make money is through a laptop so um and the venue that we're supposed to have just said that the dates that we were told we were going to have are not available and now we have to completely switch gears so i do indeed need that laptop to you know figure out last minute where we're going to book this show that we thought we had booked um so it's been a good day. No panic at all. Um, 
And so I, I, I thought the best way to, to fix that was to talk about Hannibal. But f- before we get into that, do you mind giving me a little spiritual guidance, which I, I believe is supposed to be the happy end? It is the happy. It's the second That's the ending. Yeah. That's good. At the end of the day, faith is a funny thing. It turns up when you don't really expect it. It's like one day you realize that the fairy tale may be slightly different than you dreamed. The castle, well, it may not be a castle. And it's not so important that it's happy ever after, just that it's happy right now. See, once in a while, once in a blue moon, people will surprise you. And once in a while, people may even take your breath away. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I do like that. That was a, a much happier, happier going about than we've than we've had. <laughs> yeah. Um, but and it's much happier than we're about to have. Either. It's much happier than we're about to be. So we're just, you know, we're here to provide you a roller coaster today. Mary Kate's yeah. having some some good times at trivia. My life is falling apart. Meredith Gray brings you a little bit of happiness, and then we're bringing you right back down. So thank you for joining us in this journey today. And, and as part of our inside baseball of the fact that we already told you we're doing four episodes today. Mm-hmm. Um, this is somehow not the most depressing episode we're going to have to have. Surprisingly, it is absolutely not. Also, I don't know if you watched my face when I said, how are you? And then my face immediately changed. I realized my, um, my, um, what is this microphone yeah. was not actually turned on for the recording. So if there's a 10 second delay on my end where it sounds really weird in the beginning and then starts sounding normal again, okay. that's why. Well, um, but it is connected now. I realized that, a, like, I literally introduced the podcast and then was like, I didn't check to see if my microphone was connected. So it is. Great. Everything's fine. Um, We're doing so well. We are thriving. We are literally taking over the world. Um, look, I sound like a psycho person. I'm, I sound like I'm almost like schizophrenic. I'm like, everything sucks. Everything's fine. We're going to win. Great. It's, uh, That's great. Mind over matter. <laughs> mind yeah, over yeah, matter. yeah. We're faking it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Um, I have been listening to a lot of Taylor Swift lately, specifically that one song. Just, um, I can do it with a broken heart. I'll just um, turn it back you, on today. I want, uh, there's this t-shirt that I keep seeing on the TikTok shop that I really want that says the tortured teachers department. Um, and it has like a bunch of lyrics from the album, but like changed to be about teaching. Um, do you know that you need to get off the TikTok shop? What? <laughs> Do you know that you need to get off the TikTok shop? I have not bought anything since my Adam Sandler sweater. But yeah, but I'm anticipating big things once school starts again. I know. You do buy things when school starts again. <laughs> I buy things all the time that I shouldn't mm-hmm. buy. Sure. Again, I have a story that I will tell you later about something I bought yesterday that I oh, God. should not have bought. <laughs> Excellent. Can't wait. <laughs> Sounds perfect. Well, for now, we're going to talk about Hannibal. Yes. We have made it to season two, episode three. It is called Hassan or Hassan. I do not speak Japanese as well as I speak French, so I can only be kind of certain that I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> um, but it does mean second course. It's so like, I do speak a little bit of Japanese, um, but I didn't look at the words. So H A S S U N. Hassan. Hassan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes more sense. Um, it aired March 14th of 2014, uh, not 2024, like I wrote in my notes, because <laughs> I just <laughs> auto wrote my date. And this yeah. was a good day. I wrote these notes on like Friday or Saturday. I don't even know. Um, it was rated 8.6 out of 10. Um, the number one song is Happy by Pharrell. Of so I assume is, 2014 this is... is a horrible year. I also feel like this was vaguely Despicable Me time. Um, um, I did not double check, but that does make sense. Um, March, so twenty fourteen is when I graduated from college. Kind mm-hmm. of, I graduated in December of twenty thirteen, but then I went back mm-hmm. for my actual graduation in the fall of twenty fourteen. And Happy right. had pervaded the the world so much that that was the song that they played at the beginning of our baccalaureate ceremony. Like, that's how fucked the world was in 2014. What a wild time. Yeah, I I don't, I don't approve. I don't even know what they played at my graduation. I don't even remember my graduation other than Austin 
snuck into the back where the graduates were so that he could hug me because he wasn't going to be able to stay after the ceremony. And I don't know how he got back there because there was definitely security, but we have some really cute pictures from him sneaking back there. Um, yeah, no, I was just being like really depressed because, um, my relationship that ended in 2013, like was really over and all of my mm-hmm. Facebook posts I just checked from that week were just like really sad song lyrics. And my ex's sister is the only one who liked all of them because she did not want him to not be dating me anymore. It was, it was a wild time. Bless it. <laughs> Bless it. What a time. Um, so the number one movie is Mr. Peabody at Sherman, which I do recall when it came out, but I did not watch it. Same. So I'm sure it's lovely. I think I watched a couple of the episodes of the like Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon or whatever TV show that came out after the movie. Mm-hmm. I distinctly remember the movie coming out, but I did not watch it because I never read the book as a kid. So I didn't have this. Yeah, same, I, didn't like, I didn't have the d- desire the to see it that most people did. Right. Um. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, our number one book, however, is The Undead Pool by Kim Harrison. Have you ever heard of Kim Harrison? I sure have not. Neither have I. Um, this is the 12th book in the series. It is a vampire series. Um, I have now added this to my to be read list. Which of course. We'll which see is when that so short. Right. It's I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, I don't want to tell you. Oh, sorry, Stephanie, before she got on the cruise. And uh, she's like, I don't want to tell you how long it is. I have like 168 books on mine or something. It was something, some nonsense under a thousand. And I was like, my books just on Goodreads, I have 1300 to be read. Yes. I have eight pages left of the fifth Game of Thrones book. Oh my God, you're going to finish it today. I know. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Um, it's been four did- years, four years in the making of me finishing this goddamn book i'm very proud of you and Uh is this the last one or is there a six yeah it's the last one the sixth one's the one we've been waiting for for a decade right 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 i couldn't if it actually happened or not yeah Um, but also i now am so glad that i didn't watch the like that i didn't read the books mm -hmm. when they actually came out and i read them after i watched the tv show because spoiler alert for those of you who have not watched game of thrones which i don't know how many of please don't spoiler okay Okay, no 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 there is a character (laughs) that there is a there's a character <laughs> that dies. Only if they don't. Because that happens a lot in Game of Thrones where people die, but they mm-hmm. don't. Sure. But this book ends with his death. And there has not been a book since then. Mm-hmm. So if I read the book when it actually came out and thought that he died, for real, for real. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I would have ever recovered yeah i uh i think i know what you're talking about from vague things i've seen about it but i'm not gonna ask because i'm not gonna clarify because i do want to watch it you do want to watch it yeah 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 and i want you to too so um i forgot that you hadn't yet so i won't go into that's my way my hand i saw your face completely i won't go into any more (laughs) detail than that but for those of you who have seen game of thrones i'm sure you know exactly what i'm talking about and it would have been a disaster for my mental well-being Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, well, since you're finishing it up, if you're not going straight back into your uh, Nora Roberts, is that who you're um, No, the problem is the I also started this book last summer oh, right, and right, didn't right. finish yeah. it. So I have to finish this one and nice. then I can decide where I'm going from that. So once I finish mm. Game of Thrones, I have to finish Paris Deception. And then I have to look at my to-be-read list and my pile Got of it. books and figure out where I'm going. Well, my my suggestion is to add this Kim Harrison series to your list. Um, it is very long. And they've now made a graphic novel out of the first few of them, which is very fun. So, like, it came out, the first one came out, I think it was, like, 2002, 2003 or something, or maybe four or five. But then the graphic novel came out, like, 2014. And so, like, it it actually looks really good. And it encouraged me to go back and start reading the House of Night series again. Okay. I read the whole House of Night series. They are not at all related. They are just both about vampires. That is literally the only connection. Um. And so I read the first series and now I'm reading the, it's like the other world series or something, which is like the parallel universe. I don't know. It's a spinoff series basically, but it's based got on the it, original. Got it. And so I've just finished the first one of that. Um, okay. And I've just started the second one. So also if you're looking, if you haven't read House of Night, like top notch books, um, I love them. Yeah. I think I read them a couple of times. 
Um, no, it is. It is possible series. that in a month when we record another episode of this podcast, I will have finished this other book and also then have other suggestions of books to read or not yeah. read as the case may be. I'm one of those people yeah. that once I start a book, I will finish it. Like I can never, I, the idea of mm-hmm. starting a book and not finishing it. Like I'm not one of those people who like decides Me I'm either. done with a book. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean I like them. Like I have right. finished books and then been like, just so you know, don't ever read that book. <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> Yeah. And then, I, they're like, then why did you finish much. it? Because I have a problem. I have to. <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's both of us. That's why we are the way we are. We do that with movies, with TV shows, with books. Like we if we start something, it's just that's just that's just where we're at time. now. Yeah. That's how we live. Podcasts. That's why someone is still in 2020, 21? No, um, on YouTube, I'm in 2020, but on my podcast, I'm still in 2016. You're 16. 16. Oh, yeah. to 16. Okay. Right. Um, there's one podcast that I listened to that I met the girl who does the podcast. That's why I listened to it. I met her at a convention. She mm-hmm. does a podcast about like I remember that. Girls and Star Wars. Mm-hmm. When she started the podcast, she was 12. And it's her and her friend on Skype talking about things the way 13-year-olds do. And it is horrible. And I'm sure that as she gets older, based on having met her and talked to her in person, it will not be like that. Unfortunately, where I am, she's still in middle school. Yeah. And I'm still listening to it because I can't just skip ahead. So every time it comes up on my like playlist as the next episode, I go, oh, great. <laughs> and I feel so bad. <laughs> but I would feel yeah. worse if I just quit it. I know, I know. I do that too. Um, I've been just listening to my comfort podcast, which is what I've now deemed it. Um, I've And that's my major drink, which we all know I love. And I listen to it in bulk three times a year. Um, I've only listened to the first episode. I just, I just love them so much. I mean, the first episode's a little rough because they're a little chaotic. They're both like Christine was getting ready or was writing for Nickelodeon at the time um, and was still working on like props for marvel and stuff like they had really cool jobs and now they're full-time but i'm going to see their show in september yeah um and no, so i just because they're obviously, my comfort like, podcast obviously I use I'm, them. they started the podcast in 2017 and yeah. so obviously like i'm only just getting to 2017 things mm-hmm. so i've literally only listened to the first episode and i liked it because like mm-hmm. they talked about the winchester mystery house which i yeah. fucking love which they spoiler alert redo like 200 episodes later is like a bonus episode to like because they are better because they knew now. that because they knew that they're yeah. well because it's also funny because they like talk about how the fact that they only kind of know what they're talking about <laughs> right, <laughs> which, right which i appreciate um especially because like for whatever chaos it is and the fact that it technically is a comedy podcast um last podcast on the left is the most well-researched podcast I've ever fucking listened to. That's why all of their stories. You wait till later episodes of it. That's how. No, no, no. I and I'm sure, yeah. but like in 2017 podcast. In 2017 world, podcast. In 2017 yes. podcast world, the mm-hmm. all of the murder mystery true crime that I listen to, the only one that like does the research is, is last podcast, last podcast. Right. and like every my favorite murder episode is just them talking about how if Chaos. you actually want to know go watch the my, the last podcast episode about mm-hmm. the same thing because they because Marcus Parks is the best researcher ever like yep. but so whenever I listen to anything it's chaotic because I'm so used to the level of research that um LP does so like once once people get more into because I know my favorite murder gets better I know and that's why we drink gets better. it does but it also it wavers because they end up with shorter episodes once they start doing their network it gets a little chaotic like yeah. i still listen but it no just, i know. know and i but they also kind of like change the vibe of what they're doing like yeah. later too but like the type the level of like work that they do mm-hmm. gets better and like so like i know that these podcasts are going to get better i know keep it weird gets better i know um keep it weird's amazing it's a hot mess at the beginning too though. it's a hot mess kind of now but i love them like <laughs> they have they have chaotic days like we have chaotic days and it's right amazing yeah um but but like i said all all of these i know that they get better but i'm still in the first 10 episodes of them so i'm like yeah but keep it weird like they're also really nice like i've talked to them a lot like yeah 
Instagram and then like we have like some Facebook groups like with messengers yeah like I'm sure I've talked about on the podcast before but like they're also really nice people and they are very similar to us sometimes but but my thing is so I'm just like I'm just waiting because like between geek girl being at the really early stages and like the other ones I'm still in the first 10 episodes of them I'm just like god I just need to get to the good podcast but I can't get the I know I will tell you, once you start doing it, and that's why we drink, like, they start getting better pretty fast. Um, Yeah. Same with Sinisterhood. They get better pretty fast. Uh, They cut their first few episodes, so they actually start out a lot stronger than a lot of the other ones. Well, and actually, Um, last podcast did that, too. If you go to the feed of their podcast, the earliest- It's like episode 30 or something, The early, Yeah, it was like episode 37. is the, The episode 37 is the first episode that's on there, and then, like, it's not until, like, episode- 40 or 45 or 50 that they apologize for being assholes and like because like the first couple episodes they cut their first 37 episodes and then still ended up with like episodes using the r word and i was like yeah i realized so i had listened to last podcast but i hadn't listened like past 30 and so i started i was like i haven't listened to any of these episodes that are up right now like i listened to heaven's gate two weeks ago mm. so like i'm i'm 26 15 2015 for last podcast yeah so. no i'm on i just finished episode 218 yeah i'm a little behind that um <laughs> yeah heaven's yeah. gate was what like 42 34 it's the first episode that's up right now oh right yeah yeah um and then i started zombies and i was like i can't listen to this today and so i haven't listened to it yeah. yet but yeah. um i'll either i might i don't know i'll go back to that but anyways, all all to say, I'm very interested in this book series that was number one today, um, March 14th, 2014, um, the day of our season two, episode three um, of Hannibal. So everyone should check it out because I've already added it to my Goodreads to be read list. So on this day, some things have happened. Do we talk about the movie? Yes. We sure did. It was Mr. Peabody and Sherman. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So sorry. Mm-hmm. it's okay it's it's been a minute since we yeah. did that so well, no i just when i do it i always do song book movie in that oh i was a song movie book and so my brain just didn't mm. process i've just confuddled you yeah is that a word it, it is not but i use it so excellent okay excellent great as long as we both do then we're both right <laughs> um that's that's how that works <laughs> so on this day um Jamie Lynn Spears got married at the Ottoman Tea Room in New Orleans. Now, I don't care that Jamie Lynn Spears got married. All to say, I want to go to the Ottoman Tea Room, and I always have. So that is why I put this fact down. I've never been inside. I have seen pictures. I think you have to be, like, invited. I do not remember the context, or you have to, like, rent out the whole building. Like, it's a whole shit day. Yeah. And it looks beautiful from the outside. It looks beautiful from pictures I've seen on the inside. And so I would like to put out a PSA that anyone who wants to take me to this Audubon Tea Room, it is essentially how I feel about someone who will get me into Gramercy Park. Like, these are the two things. It is much easier to get into Audubon Tea Room. I am well aware. It is also very expensive. So I need you to do both of those things. I need to find a person that can both get me into Gramercy Park and the Audubon Tea Room. Just manifesting and whatnot. I mean, I almost you, had a Gramercy you, Park guy, but I was like, if you ever get married, you could rent it out for your wedding. Right. Which is very expensive. Yeah. Um. Right. So like, it's not, it's not like exclusive. It's just expensive. Yeah. Um. And it's, it's exclusive in the sense that like, you have to be there for an event or you have to be there like with your event. Like, yeah, yeah, Gramercy yeah. Park it's, is it's like, you're just not allowed to go in. It's definitely <laughs> only an event like yeah. location. It's not. Yeah, and it's beautiful. So um I love that for whoever decides to take me there. Um also Amazon Prime raised its prices from seventy nine to ninety nine dollars a year. Um RIP to that because we are now what like one thirty nine or one twenty nine or something. Like I don't know. I just give them all of my money Correct. as I've now done again today. So it's just another day in Amazon's world. Um and last but certainly not least um paleontologists found a new pygmy t-rex in alaska i was unaware of this they found fossils not like an actual being but you know i mean they're paleontologists so i thought that might be you know come across that way i don't know much more but that just brings my heart so much joy to think about a pygmy t-rex 
It's just Listen, a little baby. It's just um, a little baby T Rex. If a pygmy T Rex looks anything like a pygmy hippo. Oh, I don't know of this. You don't know what a pygmy hippo looks like? Oh my I god, don't. look it up. Look it up right now. Oh my goodness, it's just a little baby. It's just a little baby. It's so tiny. I love him. I wonder if Austin knows. Austin's got to know about pygmy hippos. He loves hippos. Pygmy T Rex. Let's see what he looks like. I don't have any. I mean, what it's is, what, bones. What, would, what would you expect the picture to look like? All pictures of dinosaurs are wrong. I know. I know. <laughs> I just. I want to see more pictures of dinosaurs. That's all. That's all. Right or wrong. For yeah. better or for worse. Fair. Um. And also, I mean, it's still pretty big for, like, humans. Because <laughs> yeah. it's still a dinosaur. But it's a little smaller than our than the big guy we're used to. Um, maybe I'm not just, any, like, Maybe it was just a baby. I know. Maybe, it very, I like, think it, I mean, maybe sure, it they wasn't, were looking at, like, bone structure. Not, like, you know. They were, they like, were just like, oh, look at how small. Smaller version. <laughs> look at yes. how small this bone is. It must not be full. It must not not be a real yeah. one. It's a pygmy. And then they right. like, and then they test it, and they're like, oh, it's actually only it's like eight years old of bones. So like they have like like it's just a little smaller guy. Like he's just a little smaller. Oh, he's the same but smaller. It's like a um, he's like Velociraptor sized. Yeah, he's like a Velociraptor. Oh, those are words. Velociraptor T-Rex, which sounds really terrifying because those are two of the most terrifying. But they're also two of the best. Sure. Yes, truly. That is that's typically how life works. The best things in life are terrifying. Um, Wow, I am really in a low mood today, a non-positive mood today. So let's let's get more into this episode that will help with that. (laughs) Um, our director is Peter Medic, who we have talked about. He directed, oof, so we've talked about him once. Um, our writers are Steve Lightfoot, who we've spoken about, and Jason Groot, who is known for, um, so we talked about Steve Lightfoot, but Jason is known for Mad Men. He wrote one episode. So he's a writer, but he's like a limited writer. He has not written a lot of things. Okay. Um, so he wrote one episode of Mad Men, one episode of Hannibal, two episodes of nightfall and 20 episodes of rogue and those were like his biggest things okay um and he hasn't written much more out of that so he just kind of like does his own thing i guess because he's also worked a lot in theater um just kind of in general there wasn't anything specific that stuck out and he's also a teacher so this is kind of like he teaches a lot of mfa writing programs okay so i think he just kind of jumps in when someone asks yeah he like you know whatever because he's taught at um, he's currently teaching. I did not fact check this, but as of last time it was updated, he was currently teaching at UC San Diego, um, Point Park in Pittsburgh. Um, and then previously he taught at Rutgers, Hollins, National Theater Institute, and Queens College CUNY. Um, and oh, and he is also a screenwriter. And I said, look at the screenshot that you took. Um, it's He wrote one called Antigone, but anti is in parentheses. And so let me just read you the description of this story he's written. It's 30 to 45 minutes comedy drama, but it's a theater show. Um, Antigone is charged with the crime of burying her brothers, even though the war left no bodies for her to bury. Haman could take over the kingdom if he ever stops playing video games and trying to kill his father. And airline pretzels and huge corporate deals cannot satisfy Erisithon. Um, I do not know their names. I'm bad at Antigone. Erisithon's hunger in this postmodern take on Antigone. Daily life becomes mythic in the urban non-landscape of malls, highways, and airports. Um, I read Antigone ages ago, probably 10 years ago. But that is not that is not the same, but I'm very interested to see. I'm very interested in that. Right. So he had he has a few different like uh, screen uh stage shows that he's written. Okay. That was the one that I like recognized something from the rest of them were just kind of like generic or or like original original um so he sounds like a fun guy um like i said this is the only episode he wrote for hannibal so we won't see him again but kudos um and then our editor is ben wilkinson who is again returning who do you think our guest star is going to be this week 
my guess would be the the chick who's the lawyer. So no. Oh. Because it is Laura Jean Churastecki who plays Freddie Lowndes. Because we haven't talked about Freddie yet. I did re re go through my notes to make sure because she's been there a lot. But she was like in the episode where we talked about um Franklin. She was in the episode where we like introduced Beverly. Like, so it was a lot of episodes. Oh, and the one where we introduced uh Eddie Izzard. Like, these are all the episodes that she was like main focus of. And so obviously we talked about someone else yeah. instead of her because we knew she'd come back. Um okay. so she's known for Nightmare Alley, which I think I need to rewatch. It's I I don't fall asleep a lot in movie theaters, and I fell asleep in this movie theater. Um, I also was going through a rough time, so could be me, could be the movie. Who's to say? Who's to say? Um, Probably don't watch it today then. <laughs> right, right. Not today is not today. It is too long. I do know that because it was like three hours long for mm-hmm. like a whodunit style film. Like it's too long. No, but it yeah. may be okay. Just long. Um. She's also known for Hannibal, obviously, obviously, Reacher, and Designated Survivor. So she's, like, done a lot of stuff. Um, one of my favorite credits of hers is one that I don't remember, but I do remember this episode. She was in an episode of Degrassi, The Next Generation, oh. and she played, played Molly. And the episode she was in, again, don't remember her, she, is when Peter and Darcy started dating. And did you watch, were you a big Degrassi person? I feel like we talked about this. Okay. Yeah. So Peter, mm, terrible human, but it's when him and Darcy started dating. And so of course there's no way, there's no way for me to remember her as Molly because there were a lot of other things happening. Uh, yeah. But that was one of her earlier credits. Um, she's also the youngest person, the youngest ever person accepted into the Birmingham, Cons- Birmingham Conservatory in Ontario um and last but certainly not least to stick to her horror genes she is currently in the new chucky tv show unless it's ended but she plays like the sister of someone Mm, like one of the main characters so she is like a main person in the show um currently so seven years later we're ready to start the episode um and we start with our previously on where we're looking at the lures, Katie Purnell, Will's memories, um, and how Beverly talks about that she's saying, I think he still wants to save lives. Yes. So we have a pretty good setup for where we're going. Um, and so we start with a very disturbing scene where we are undoing Will dying in the electric chair. Um, yeah, it was weird and uncomfy. Yeah, um, I'm not getting into a conversation about the death penalty. I think we've talked about it before, but it was just very disturbing to watch. Yeah. Um, because just a lot that goes into that. So we and we see Will being the one to actually flip the switch um, on his own electric chair, which I'm sure is very symbolic um, as it would be. Yeah. Um, but then we show him waking up in a sweat because obviously it's a dream like we know. This is not where he's at yet. We haven't even had a trial. We haven't done anything. That's where we're starting. Right. So, um, and typically it will say something like 12 years later or 12 years ago if we are seeing an actual scene. Correct. Um, and so then we see this like cut back and forth scene where Hannibal and Will are um getting ready for the trial and they are just like mirrors of each other. Um that was again, cool. Symbolism. Um and then we start our trial. And the prosecutor starts by discussing, of course, Garrett Jacob Hobbs' case, because this case is the one that never dies. Um, and yeah. says that's what really sent Will over the edge. He had gotten into other people's heads, but this is the head that he got into that he basically couldn't get back out of. Um, Which is true. That is, in fact, it a is, fact. That is a fact. Um, does not make him a murderer. But those facts can still be true. Yes. Um, but she does talk him up so much to show how capable he is, how to show how smart he is, to show that he is capable of being this manipulative, of being this psychopath. Yeah. Um, and she keeps saying, like, this is how he's created this alibi that makes sense. 
but isn't true basically um and so then we get ready for jack to be on the stand and so him and katie perel are talking um and they're talking about will's case and katie's like you're no longer like you're not impartial but you can be like i know that you know you can do all of this you just have to remember him as like he's on trial because of the things he's done he's not the same person like you right. know him as and um, she she basically yeah. she's like right now your job is not to tell them what you think your job is to tell them what the bureau thinks right and she's like and make sure you're following the evidence like the evidence leads to conviction follow the evidence yeah um and so then jack gets on the stand to give his testimony and he starts discussing like will's initial in, um intro to the fbi which we already we like kind of knew about but he really tells us like he found him while he was teaching he started doing some screeners he didn't pass the screeners for fbi because of his mental state yeah. um and because of his you know autistic tendencies like he had a lot of different things that people were just like not passing him for yeah um and so she's like yeah i see like so he didn't pass the fbi screenings which is just another indication that he is not fit to be doing this job right. and therefore he's a psychopath who killed everyone and it's like okay stretch but okay yeah but like we made a jump we um he, right he should not have been there 100 percent agree with you on right. that don't know how that that then translates to serial killer yes those are those are not the same thing are- um and so while she's making her leap jack cuts in and he's like will didn't do this he's like i don't believe that will like because she's like he was using the fbi as a cover like this is all the things he was doing jack's like absolutely not like no, he, he was didn't like, want like to be yeah he was like the only thing that i can guarantee i don't know the answer to any of this the only thing i can promise you is that not one minute of this job did will yeah. enjoy never was he using us for cover never was he enjoying the fact that he was getting away with it he was miserable yeah. all of that the was time all on us like he was like he hated the work i I pushed him. Everyone who had ever met Will or me told me I had to stop pushing him. Like if I, if he went too far, he was gonna break. And it wasn't in a serial killer psychopathic way. It was in an emotional state yeah. way. Yeah. Um. And we just see a shot of Katie Perel, and she is just not pleased. She is very upset with the situation and how it is playing out. Um. And then the defense attorney like so then you know we're past that and the defense attorney is stoked <laughs> he's like jack has paved the way for our defense to go through with flying colors like yeah. this is amazing and will's like well he never said i was innocent and like you're not proving like or like he's not saying i didn't do it and the defense attorney just looks at him and says innocence is not a verdict not guilty is yeah. which sounds harsh and sounds like to to like laymen or people that don't know about the law it's like well why would that even be a thing no that's true it like if it doesn't really matter (laughs) if you say like if you're innocent but then you get a guilty plea like get a guilty you know outcome that's just the name of the game essentially yeah Um, no i have a lot of work to be done in the legal system but agreed um no i'm kind of obsessed with this lawyer me too i i love him so much (laughs) But he was like, because um, my favorite was he was like, he was like, Will didn't say, or Jack didn't say I didn't do it. And he goes, neither did did we. That was never, that's not what right. we're doing here. And he was like, and Will accuses him of advertising. And he goes, what do you think law is? What do you think law is? Like, I wish I could be him. I am not um, as savvy, I guess, as charismatic or confident. I don't know. Well, and that's why, what the word is. That's why like, so many lawyers go into things like, um, corporate litigation or um yeah. like uh public public works and like marriage and death certificates and that kind and like for <laughs> like and like like uh real estate law and things like that yeah. because criminal law is a fucking mind fuck and especially defense attorneys not you can get up there and just twist shit to the point where no because never once do you have to be to to say that your person is innocent just that they're not guilty exactly like you it's all it's all advertising i mean that's all the law is anyways it's who can make the better pitch for people to buy yep and uh, like i i wish that was me because i think that's such a 
hard job. Both DAs and public defenders, I think, have such oh, hard jobs. Sure. And it's so like intense. And like Nick was even asking me whenever I was first coming back, he was like, Well, do you think you'd want to work like even just like in public defense for a bit, like to get like, you know, government benefits and everything? And I was yeah. like, I don't know that I could. Like, I first of all, I don't I'm not a litigator. That is not in me. I hate speaking in front of people. I know that's contrary to popular belief for me speaking on here, but I hate speaking in front of people that can see me. Um <laughs> that I could also see back. <laughs> right. It just makes me too nervous. And so yeah. I wish I could do this job and I cannot. I am very much a one on one negotiation attorney and like see, writing. I, I could <laughs> do the performance aspect mm-hmm. of litigation. I could ask the questions. I could convince you. I could sway you because in a courtroom, you're an actor. Like, let's right. be real. Mm-hmm. All of the shit that happens like before. You get to the courtroom, the research, the testing, the schooling for lawyers, the understanding the law, count me fucking out of that shit. See, so it makes such a good but like, if, Yeah, if the of two lawyers. of us could be like combined as one single law license, we would be the yes. world's best litigator because you would do all of the actual work and I would just get up there and fucking convince everyone of everything. Unfortunately, it. that's not how they give law licenses. Yeah. And see, I can do that one-on-one. I cannot do that in front of other people. I yeah. don't have the acting gene. Um, I'm just going to put on my law license, Courtney Cloud, comma, Esquire, comma, plus Mary Kate, and see if that works. Right, <laughs> give it right, a test right. run. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this attorney is amazing. I love him. I hope I don't regret that. Um, so far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good. So, he also, they're sitting there, and as they're talking about this, he opens up a piece of mail and an ear and flaky blood, which is the disgusting. Most disgusting thing. Th- yeah, uh, the most honest, disgusting. N- nope, there's something that happens later this episode that is far more disgusting. It does. I just really hated this part. Um, yeah. Oh, for sure. And he's like, uh, I think I got your mail. And then we hit the credits. <laughs> like, what a time. What a time to be alive. Um, this was such a crazy episode yeah my god everything we're watching this week is a lot um so then we go to hannibal and jack and jack is just like flying high he's like i may have lost my job i don't know what's coming next maybe it's for the best let's celebrate let's do this let's do this and hannibal's like did you like was your testimony a resignation um and he's like i don't know i i will see but i feel like it was the right thing to do i don't regret it and yeah um he's like i've given my life to death and um uh, hannibal just says and now death has followed you home like basically you've made your bed now you have to lie in it yes um but then they start talking about bella and how he's like i kind of i want her to be able to die in italy like that's where we met that's how things like everything started like i just think that'd be so nice but she doesn't want to like kind of hang in there that long um and then hannibal ends by telling him like don't leave the fbi like yes it's sad to think about not being able to spend those last few days with your wife but then like you're still here after and like we still need you in the fbi aka you usually listen to me i still need you in the fbi correct that was Um, that was uh cute yeah good times um we we have a quick little jaunt over to the lab where they're studying the ear from the trial um and they start saying that maybe someone else did do the crime like maybe it wasn't will like yeah of course do we see what's happening now but it's fine whatever so they don't they don't have any answers so we'd go over the hospital and the mental hospital and hannibal is saying like that it didn't even occur to him to send an ear to will during the trial but he's so glad someone did and i was like it kind of sounds like he didn't do it even though like of course he did you know like well, okay. I want to save my conversation mm. of what I think about Hannibal to the end because I have okay. a lot of thoughts that are very I'm I'm not mm. sure how I feel about it because there was there's some yeses and nos of things in this episode that got it. Yeah. But I see. Yeah. Right. Right. So we'll my, yes, him- my my analysis of Hannibal's um what is the word I'm looking for? Participation. Participation oh. in these crimes. I'm going to save to the end until we have all the details mm-hmm. of all the crimes of the episode. 
sure yeah um so that's a word that i don't know what it says um do, 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 do. oh he so will so he's talking to will and will's like telling him he's like i know that accusing you makes me look insane like i understand that yeah um he's like so i you know basically i'm not gonna do it anymore because i know it makes me look insane but i still didn't commit these crimes like i don't know what to do next um and then hannibal kind of like switches gears and he's like well whoever sent you the ear definitely cares about you like he's like that's that's a thing um and then we're back at the trial <laughs> with our with our friend freddie and dear god dear god this woman um first of all she walks in looking like she just came from the queen's funeral like what, she's got what was that like one of those like ladies hats on like, yeah she literally looked like grace kelly or audrey hepper like she was like right. dressed like a 40s movie star at a funeral and i was like yeah. bitch what right and she just walked in with like this air of drama you just know this is not good for and anyone. then she fucking lied her teeth off. absolutely a hundred percent she starts discussing abigail and she says that abigail thought will wanted to eat her like her dad did like they're going through this whole thing and she's like i was always i always knew it was will like we were gonna write this book and i just knew it and somebody was like well did um uh did you think do you blame yourself for this and she was like absolutely not i blame will graham and then and like and then I decided to promise my firstborn child to this lawyer because all he did, <laughs> he stood up and he said, so uh, Miss Lowndes, how many times have you been sued for libel? And she was like, uh, six. six. And he goes, and how many times have you had to settle on those suits? And she goes, uh, six. And he goes, thank you. That's it. That's right. all he said. He basically was like, throw this bitch's testimony in the garbage. Right. Which is fair for a character witness but not for an actual witness so i'm i'm guessing they're using her as a character witness um, well yeah but i mean because how would they she has no evidence she's just knew abigail right. and her feelings mm -hmm. on it she was oh she would have conversations with will and abigail right she couldn't be a witness to anything other than will's character mm -hmm. which is also she's not good for but it's well fun. for prosecution yeah she was the pro no, but i mean like yeah, oh. but still, she doesn't I mean, know him well enough to be a good character witness. But, like, but she saw the tension between him and Abigail, and then Abigail went missing, so so she must know something. Like, she must right. know what kind of person he is. The prosecution fucked themselves from... They absolutely did. She they, All she had was hearsay. She had nothing but hearsay every every like, person Every person that the prosecution pulled was a terrible choice. This prosecutor, like, sucks. She sounds like she... She has already figured out her end game. Does not have a second play. No, and she and doesn't. She doesn't have anything other than the evidence. But she has to do the whole trial. So she's just like right. calling witnesses for shits. Like I don't. I don't Which understand. Is fine, but prep your witness. Like if you're gonna have a witness, prep your witness. That's part of it. Like yeah. God forbid. Um. So then like, we get and if you friend. have a okay. witness that has six libel lawsuits, fucking make sure that they disclose that before the cross-examination right. exactly like that is not that's not the time for it to come out in court um so then we go to our friend alana bloom and she is practicing in front of will as you do prepping your witness mm -hmm. speaking of yeah and they start so of course the attorney starts discussing romantic feelings and he's like this is gonna come up she's like how is that relevant he's like it's super relevant so we gotta discuss it because right we want to disclose it before someone else does yeah again everything we just said yes um and so she does she's like i don't have romantic feelings i only have a professional curiosity and he was like you have to make sure that's believable it currently is but you have to make sure yeah he was like he was like that would be he was like that would be great if you weren't lying i mean right it didn't seem like you were so we're good but like but make sure this is the like lowest level you're getting yeah i'm <laughs> doing this like bless it um so then we go back to the lab and we get this like weird visual of the ear. Like this, this show has so the, many the, things when, that catch this, me off guard. Is this when it like spiraled out mm -hmm. of the ear into like yeah. the lab, the camera? I was like, what is happening? Yeah, we get so many random weird scenes yeah. <laughs> with stuff like this. Um, and then we also learn that Will's knife 
is the knife that was used to cut the ear off. And I want to know how we know that because I don't like, I know they said they had the knife in evidence, but they didn't mention his fingerprints on it. How do they know that it's not just a model that looks like his? Like, was there something I missed that made that more specific? Um, I don't think so. I think that it is just that obviously it's the same blade, like, in the serration or whatever. So I guess it could be the exact same knife. But in this case, if you're dealing with a crime that is copying mm. someone to the point of using literally the same exact batch like not even just model but batch yeah. of blade because the thickness can be variable like right everything has to be exactly the same so it's like literally it's really really difficult to make knives identical mm -hmm. because any single right. like fluctuation any single like change in the sharpening of the knife can change the knife so yeah. either this person copied will's crime and was in it enough to know what kind of knife he had and copy the knife or it's the same knife like that's right so which like i i'm open to either thing because we know the copycats in this case are very particular right are very like i mean he like hannibal wove hair through the lures to make it look like it yes. Will's it is. so like i don't put anything past it it just it felt a little well, okay, and do is this when they tell Best. us that the knife is also missing? Or is that I thought later? they said it was in custody? Maybe they said it was missing. I I may maybe they said it was missing from custody and I thought they said it was in custody. Okay, yeah. I don't so remember. This is that scene. This is that scene. It, I just it, but is this when they it. tell you that the guy took it? Maybe. Okay, I because remember. I don't remember if this is this scene or a different scene, but not only do they have Will's knife in custody, the bailiff from the courthouse checked it out and it never got checked back in. So, I think that was this scene. Okay. So if it's the same pattern and the knife is missing from custody, it's that knife. Like there's mm. too many. See, I heard those things backwards. Mm. I heard that they now had it in custody after he had checked. Oh, it no, no, no. I heard yes. that backwards. They, they had it in the evidence for the file, mm. but the bailiff checked it out and it never got returned. Right, right, so right. the cut, the knife that was in custody for this trial is missing. Right. So that is too many coincidences. Yeah, Cause we, for we see the knife at the scene. So they found it. It just was never checked. But that makes sense. I, my brain yes. went. Yeah. 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 Places. No. So yeah. So the bailiff um, took it out. Yeah. Which means right. it had to be the same knife because it's not missing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah so it's will's knife that cut the ear off um and that's still all we know about the ear we don't we haven't determined a lot of other things yet no. um we go to the investigation we, oh but we do also know that the ear was cut off of a corpse like it wasn't alive right. when it got mm -hmm. cut off it was cut off of a dead person yes yes um so we go to the investigation and as the fbi is going in the home has been rigged up to catch fire when entered so as soon as they open the door, it's like a um, the Rube way Goldberg machine. The way I gasped when that flint struck. I know. I don't know what I was expecting. I I didn't think that it was going to be that easy. But the way I gasped when that flint struck. I know. It's such a wild time. Um, yeah. And so they, of course... Once they get the the flames out, they go in and the body has been burnt to a crisp. It is settled on the antlers and the ear is missing. This is where we actually learn it was the bailiff that's been murdered. Um, and the whole time now, like the whole team is there plus Hannibal's there because he's been called in. Um, and they start arguing over whether or not they should have taken a stool sample um, previously. To see if Will actually ate anything. Right. Yeah. To see if Will had actually eaten anything. And that was just a little bit of a like. 
comedic approach at that. I was like, eh, that's fine, I guess. Yeah, um, it's true. I mean, like, I mean, to be into- fair, to be fair, a little dose of like stoogism yeah. from those guys is kind of necessary because this is so fucking heavy. Yeah, and I think anytime Price and Zeller talk, like, it's just it feels like they're the comedic duo like yeah. they're just they're just thrown in there for com- comic relief yeah. i'm sure they have a good purpose i'm sure they do a good job but oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> that is what i think every time they speak um which is fine i guess and then so then we jump back over to the courthouse and jack and katie again are discussing in front of the judge everything and the judge is like this is not for either of you to decide like this is for the defense to tell me like yeah. I don't know why we're having this conversation here. You're not even on this case, um, which I guess technically Katie Perel is above the like the DA's office, so she's a, in charge of the prosecutor. But Jack is not a partner; like he's not on either of the sides um, yeah. of this case. And then we jump over into Will's mind palace for a little moment before going back to the trial. And now we have children on the stand, and. God bless. God bless. I I hate this man. Um, so Chilton starts talking about Will and he's like, he's like, yeah, there's nothing I can say about him. Like he doesn't want to talk to me. Like it's such a disaster. He claims that he has Asperger's. He claims that he has this empathy disorder, like, but there's no way to prove it because I can't work with him. He's never been tested, blah, blah. blah. And he's just, he sounds like the petty kid who was like, well, they didn't let me play, so they all suck at this game. Like, that is exactly what it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and he's talking about how, like, no one can test him. And, like, realistically, at this point, it's not going to be valid anyways. Like, Will knows too much about the inner workings of these things that, like, yeah. any testing done on him is not going to be accurate, really. Um, But he just, and then Chilton, just, like, the way he's talking, he sounds like a Batman villain yes like that is all i hear for this whole time he's just like well here's all the things that are going on and this is why it sucks to be him like um and then he does go on to say like which is a better better argument for the prosecutor but not great he says that the only reason will was in the fbi to catch these other killers was to prove he was smarter than them which is a psychopathic tendency and that is that does make the most sense like it it doesn't because we know will but like yeah but that is that is the first the first piece of anything that the prosecution has said that makes sense right absolutely so okay so chilton's their better witness um which is sad to say and then we jump back over to the hospital again um and hannibal and will are chatting and Hannibal is showing Will pictures of the bailiff. Um, and he's like, what's different? So I stop on this picture like a lunatic, trying to figure out if I can see anything that has happened. I I can't. Why why do I think I can see anything in this picture? I'm just I'm just staring at a horrible image. Um however, you know, Will then jumps into his rewind. Um and he starts, you know, recreating yeah. the scene. And he's like, this he's like you died you died believing we were friends that's the last thought that he had which is very sad sad. um and then he says the death isn't personal though and of course as always he comes back to this is my design like that's always kind of the callback phrase um but he does say that this is not the same killer because he was dead before he was mutilated yeah and this is the scene that was for me the most difficult to watch because they i mean they do a lot of fucked up stuff on the show there's blood Mm -hmm. there's violence there's body parts being sawed into stakes like whatever right for some reason the idea that the camera never panned away to him like cutting the face and then chopping the ear off and like obviously he was supposed to already be dead and obviously i know it wasn't a real fucking person there like i'm not stupid but that everything else that has been that violent has been like insinuated like they show they show him starting to cut the face but then like it turns away or they They show show the the, aftermath they show the body part they show the initial stab and then the body part but for some reason that full like 
chop of the ear with the blood dripping down the side and him walking away with the ear Mm -hmm. was I literally I literally looked at Dan and I go they just showed us that whole thing like that was for me gag work like I yeah I because because it wasn't artful right and, and it was, and, and I think that was the point. I think yeah. that, but I think that was the point. I actually think it was the point to show that this, unlike the other crimes we've seen, other, unlike the art that Hannibal does, this mm-hmm. wasn't that. Right. This was butchery. This was hack job. This was its purpose wasn't the the art, right. which goes into what I'm going to talk about at the end. But this being as visual as it was was really upsetting to me. Yeah, it was it was definitely a really hard visual because, like you said, we're used to seeing, you know, we're not used to seeing it actually happen. We've seen the aftermath and um, this show has done a pretty decent job of staying away from. I mean, it's had a lot of gory moments. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but it's never been gratuitous. Right. And this felt a little different. And I do think you're right that it is like for a reason. Yeah. Um, But we'll talk about this in the next episode, too, like. It's, I'm concerned it's starting to go in the direction that it's going to be a little more gratuitous than just what's necessary for gore, I guess. Um, yeah. And this, I feel like, was the start. And maybe it's intentional to show that this is kind of the start of unraveling in general, not just for visuals, you know? Um, so we'll see how that yeah. goes. Um, so then... So yeah, so then we're back with Hannibal and Will, and Hannibal's telling him he's like, "I want you to believe the best in me." He was like, "Because I, I believe the best in you," and I was like, "God bless him. He's, God, he's such a psychopath. Like he has no idea. Yeah. Like he knows, but he just doesn't grasp. Yeah. It's so strange." Um, and then he starts telling him like, "Even Jack is ready to believe," and Will's just like, "It would be a lie." Like if Jack starts believing, you know, the wrong things, like it's just, I don't know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot. And so he's panicking a little bit inside. So then we go to Alana and Will and we learn that they're abandoning, abandoning their entire defense, which may a terrible purpose. idea. I mean, it, I, don't it, know. <laughs> I don't know, but I think it's a terrible so, idea because I think you've built so much and you've done so much research on this defense that changing your defense midway is going to screw you. If you're not, fully ready for it and turns out they probably weren't so i i feel more on the side of the defense where he's talking about because a lot of course is pissed that's how she feels she's like this is where we are if we ruin this like it's you know it's going out the window you can't raise this defense again once it's been changed like it just is what it is and it's like yes those are correct facts however with this new evidence it is much easier to prove reasonable doubt because murder is such a high stake that it's much easier to prove reasonable doubt and get it dropped entirely as opposed to pleading not gu- not guilty due to, you know, insanity or automation or whatever she called it, automatism. Um, yeah. It's, a, it's now a much easier bar to say that it's not 100% that he did it as opposed to proving insanity or automatism because those are harder defenses, especially with someone who's hard to test. Yeah. Um, and when you're working with psychologists like Hannibal and psychologists like Chilton who are loose cannons in themselves because they may or may not report correctly. They may or may not test correctly. Like, and that's what you have to rely on for those kind of defenses. Um, And so I think it's now a harder bar to prove automatism as opposed to just proving reasonable doubt, because now that the same knife has been used in the same crime and is being, and will is being taunted while he's still in jail it makes it feel like it's less likely he did this stuff. Yeah. Um, because also the only people who can tell the difference in the crimes are Will and Hannibal. Right. Like no one else is seeing that these differences of the body being dead before mutilation of, you know, different stuff like that. So um, I think that's a better route, but we'll see. How but I think, um, I think it, I think what Alana's point is just that while it might actually be a better defense, it, You've already done all the prep work mm-hmm. for the trial in one defense. Switching mid-trial is not necessarily incorrect, but you yeah. better be prepared for it. Right. 
I think the problem is like the, with the original defense, like he did do all this work on it, but it still didn't have a lot of certainty. Like it was still so up in the air because of yeah. what the prosecution was introducing, what the witnesses were introducing, like, because it was such, it was already such a hard case with, even with all the research and all of the stuff they'd put into place, like it wasn't certain other, the only thing they had going for them really was Jack's testimony. Like, and so if he were to one, if he were to recant that, their entire case is gonna blow up. Yeah. Um, just based on that one thing. So I think it's I think it is a good idea, but I do think it's playing it safer if you don't switch, obviously, because then you don't have to worry about mistrials or starting over or any of that. Um but yeah, so then we go back. Um, uh, oh, and of course the defense is like, I'm not putting you on the stand. Like at this point, you don't agree with my, you know, methods, you're not going on the stand. So we go back to the trial, and now our friend Hannibal is on the stand um for better or for worse yeah and will sees him as the deer man as he's sitting on the you know on the stand um and he starts blaming himself and he's like i felt him i was supposed to be his stability i was never his like i was never his licensed therapist i was never meant to be the one to like diagnose him i was just meant to be his stability in the fbi um and so then of course he's talking about the bailiff's murder he's discussing they even bring up like they're like well didn't will blame you before like why do we want to listen to you now he was like of course he blamed me but like i don't hold any grudge against him for that yeah he was like will graham is and will always be my friend and i was like that's not how that goes and of course then shortly after we learn that hannibal's testimony will be stricken because he has just completely messed up his whole character witness like he's not a reliable character witness anymore yeah um and then we have a few cut scenes where jack is examining the picture um and we see kind of hannibal kind of looking sad he's staring at you know the empty seat where will would normally be in his office um will's back in his cell looking like at a bit of a loss um and then we go back into um the will's mind for a bit we see the empty jail we see like nobody's really in there and then we follow it up by the janitor who is now buffing the floor and we follow him on his little journey through the courthouse and we get into the courtroom and as soon as he opened the door we look up and we see that the judge has been strung up his brain and his heart have been um cut out placed on the uh the balance the scale yeah the scale that's the word i was looking for on the scale and he is no longer alive he also um, has um blindfold on because because it's the statue of justice yeah yeah so he is not only statue of justice but they're in there examining it and hannibal said hannibal says that he's that it's obviously to display that he's both that justice is blind but justice is not only blind but it's also heartless and mindless yeah yeah which i was looking i was looking for a hannibal quote from this scene it wasn't that one that's a really good one but hannibal says something in the scene that i didn't write down and i really wish i would have because i can't remember exactly what he said but it's the whole reason why i'm confused and Mm -hmm. i think it has to do with how good of an actor max mickelson is because obviously we know hannibal does a lot of this stuff but Hannibal says something in the scene to Jack about what about why someone would be trying to how why someone would be using this method to try to save Will. Right. And in it, it basically is him being like, I did it because I don't know what else to do. He's my friend. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because Jack tells him that this is for sure going to be a mistrial because now you have to start with a new judge. You have to start over. And Hannibal's like, well, that's what basically he says, like, that's what the killer wanted. Like, yeah. he needed that because there was no other option in this case. Well, but so this exactly. And so that line and I don't remember. I wish I got I and I literally just like tried to find the quote anywhere and I couldn't. But I didn't dig too deep because I also didn't mm-hmm. want spoilers. Right. But anyway, um, it's really interesting to me because this is so unlike Hannibal Mm -hmm. nothing about these crimes is intelligent enough um it's also incredibly wasteful yeah and that is for me the most difficult part to believe Mm -hmm. because I understand that Hannibal cares for Will I understand that Hannibal is trying to make sure he doesn't lose the only person that he thinks understands him right but Hannibal 
if we look at the way his character is portrayed in the books, in the movies, and everything, the idea of him committing crimes that are so wasteful for yeah. any reason just feels incorrect. Yeah. And, and I, th- I go ahead. and I think that it I think it's on purpose. Like I said, I think there's mm-hmm. reasons for why they also are like less artistic than some of the other crimes and everything. I think that it's intentional. And I think that it is another level to Hannibal's manipulation, but it also just feels it. It feels like it's not him. And it almost feels like someone else is doing it. And the things that he's saying is that he's jealous of whoever is doing this to save Will because he doesn't, he doesn't understand why someone else is doing what he can't do to save Will. And it's a really confusing thing. And I think that it just shows that Matt Mickelson is like the most fucking amazing actor ever. And if it turns out that it is a hundred percent Hannibal doing all of these things, I won't be surprised or upset, but I, I kind of like the thought that maybe it's not, and maybe there's Mm -hmm. a whole other emotional level to it of him trying to genuinely solve these things because someone else is saving Will when he can't. And yeah. it also, the last line of this episode, sorry, I know we're skipping ahead just it's a okay. quick second, but the last line of this episode is Alana saying that I, saying, I want to save you. Yeah. And I think that that, that leads me to believe she knows more about things than she is letting on also. Yeah, I can see where you're going with that. I don't think. A lot. I do see what you're saying, and that that line does feel very specific. Yes. Um, and I think she could find out something and let it go because of that. Um, but I don't know that she's involved yet. Um, I do. Th- I I do have mixed feelings about whether or not Hannibal was involved in the bailiff's murder, because while I do think it feels like something he would do, and his talking about it like it's removed also feels like something he would do for manipulation. Um. It is a different technique. Um, and but because of the way he talks about it with Will, it makes me think like, did he do a different technique on purpose? Like, so I've a right. mixed feeling. Exactly. About That's what I'm saying. Everything, everything about it yeah. is very it's it it's very well yeah. done because mm-hmm. I have such mixed feelings about it. The fact that the show has been written in a way to give me those mixed feelings yeah. is phenomenal. But at the end of this episode, I genuinely don't know if Hannibal killed them or not. I do feel like he killed the judge. And I think that's because, like, I feel like this is a piece of while we're seeing Will unravel and rebuild, we're kind of seeing the opposite mirror reaction with Hannibal, where he has been in control and been so stable that now he's starting to unravel. And we know that's one thing we know about psychopaths is a lot of they like a lot of their consistency or like a lot of their feelings are spaced around control, not like power is a lot of the leading pieces. And he feels like he's out of control a little bit because he can't control the case. He can't control the law. He cannot control what happens to Will. However, he can do things that, you know, affect that. And when he got on the stand and he was trying to be manipulative in his speech and because of the feelings he's starting to have for Will, like as a friend, um, like seem to like cloud his judgment of the best thing to say on the stand. I think that that's where he felt like he completely lost control and so his only reaction was to take control back. And it was by completely wiping the slate clean, starting a mistrial. And so I do think, um, I do and think that's, that it's weird that he was fair. wasteful, but I think yeah. it was because of his lack of control. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. The the bailiff just doesn't feel right. The though. bailiff is the one that feels really off kilter. And like, it only feels like Hannibal to have sent him an ear, but I don't know if maybe like, but also there's no copycats left that we know about. So he could have, you know, brought someone else in because we know he likes to do that sometimes like we know he likes to get involved with other people so maybe it's something like that but i just i don't know it's very strange um the way it's all going yeah Um, but yeah so we leave the courtroom we go back to jack and katie and she starts basically threatening jack that if he doesn't get on the side of the court the court that he's going to be left behind just like will and it's like well that's not how that yeah. works um and then we get like this cool visual of what looks like almost like a heartbeat of flash images so it's like it's beating almost in a heartbeat pattern um where we end being on will kind of in his brain 
and the door to his cell opens and he walks out to see the deer and starts following it. And then the last thing like he kind of sees is Hannibal calling to him with an open door. And obviously this is all kind of in his mind, but like that's the next little bit we get. Yeah. Um, and then we go to our last scene of Alana and Will. And she's saying that she's hoped that Will's verdict would console him. So she's upset that there's a mistrial because now it's just going to keep going and being, you know, like we don't have any definite answer yet. Right. Um, And she starts talking about like this, like you could have been misdiagnosed, like all these things. He's like, I've already been misdiagnosed. And she's like, not officially. And he's like, well, sure. But like, they've already said I'm guilty without saying I'm guilty. And yeah. they've already decided that I'm a psychopath without officially deeming me a psychopath like yeah. so technically but actually like you know um but he does tell her that he thinks the killer was in the courtroom the whole time and he does think that the killer is going to reach out to him directly mm-hmm. um and this is where she says that she wants to save him yeah and this is where we end the episode so um who who do you want to punch? Freddy. Yeah. Yeah. I know it doesn't really seem like a big enough reason to, but No, she yeah. was she was one of my two that I picked. Um I also thought Freddy was a good option because she really it feels like she went out of her way uh-huh. to be unhelpful. Um so because you picked Freddy, I'm picking uh Chilton. Because oh, as yeah, I mentioned, I just hate him. Um, and he is the Batman villain that sucks, so that's stupid. Um, who's your MVP then? A lawyer. Yeah. Yeah, that is definitely the best option. He's gonna be the one most effective for Will and is actually doing his job correctly. Yeah. Um, which is nice. So um I'm gonna go with Jack because he also is the only other like resource Will currently has right now that's on his side enough to know that it's not even if will comes out guilty it's not his fault but also kind of believes will's not guilty like it's a yeah but like he's he's, he does have those feelings he does think will's guilty he does obviously have some like emotional connection but he's not as clouded as hannibal or alana he's like separated his himself right um which we thought last week that only beverly had been able to do but jack is starting to show that he is not not he's trying to pull himself out of his emotional he is i think guilt is still clouding him a bit oh yeah um but he's a lot more neutral now than than most people for sure um yeah so that's definitely true um i do have one piece of trivia for you um so in one of the scenes they're talking about like essentially occam's razor but he says occam's broom and I was yes. like, was that like a weird thing he was saying? Or is it real? No, it's real. Um, so Occam's broom was invented. I think it was 2014. Like it was pretty recent by a molecular biologi- biologist, Sidney Bremer, who wanted to draw attention to the process of hiding or ignoring inconvenient facts to argue a case better um, with them swept under the rug. And so it's a little different from Occam's Razor, but it's still a similar concept. Yeah. Um, so I never knew about that. And it is perfect for yeah. this situation. Um, yeah. So I know we did talk about our feelings for a bit. Do you have some more feelings uh, about this episode? Um, no. I know we've already seen next week, so we have yeah. some other things going on. But um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else either. So on that note, if you have any feelings or anything um, or a thousand dollars for a new computer, you can email us <laughs> death and aliens at gmail.com. You can find us on all of the social media at death and aliens. You can find me at CE cloud 13. And you can follow me everywhere at E M K A Y underscore superstar. And we will see you on Sunday for sci-fi Sunday. And it'll be fine. It's an okay. So it made me a little sad. So stay tuned. All right. Bye.